Welcome to another lecture of Invertebrate Paleontology and Paleobotany at Utah State University. In this lecture, we will examine the question, what are the major groups of mollusks, and how are their fossil record distributed through time? The phylum Molluscidae is one of the most diverse of all the invertebrate groups they'll be looking at only out diversified by the anthropods. The, these are including the insects. But in many ways, when you look at the numbers of species, the mollusks are much better represented in the fossil record. Mollusks include slugs and snails, um, scallops, clams, oysters, and cephalopods that include um, squids, octopuses, as well as ammonites and belemonites. It's, it's a really, really big group of animals to cover in a single lecture, uh, but we can simplify the group when we look at the archetype of mollusca, or the shared features that all of these groups have in common, or at least ancestrally they have in common. Here it is. It's, it's a rather weird looking animal. It has a cap-like shell that's composed of um, calcium carbonate on top which is secreted by a layer of, of tissue below called a mantle. It has a gut with a mouth at one end. Over here is a mouth and an anus on the other end. Now it poops into this chamber right here. This is called the mantle cavity. And it also contains a gill. Now gills are found in all mollusks except for land snails, which develop lungs. Now, gills are an important adaptation because it allows for the respiration to more easily take place in a body. Cells along the gills can take up oxygen from the water and transport this oxygen throughout the body through the canal system of a, a primitive circulatory system. Now, the reason oxygen is needed is that it's required in cells' mitochondria to be used in the production of ATP molecules that help produce the energy needed for cell growth. Cells can produce ATP without oxygen, but this only produces a small amount of ATP, hence only used for short periods. Now, having a mechanism to bring oxygen into the cells of the body is really important, especially since many mollusks cover their bodies with hard shells. And hence, it's really difficult to gather oxygen out of the surrounding water. So they've developed these gills. Now, brachiopods, they don't have gill structures because they have that lophophore in which, in addition to gathering food particles, can also gather oxygen from the water. Now, mollusks don't have a lophophore. Food gathering in mollusks is really, really different. They have like this simplified mouth that sometimes has these teeth called radula. Um, this means that mollusks can um, pursue food sources, and many are mobile. Some specialized as grazers, others as active predators, and even some filter feeders. The lack of a lophophore suggests that mollusks are more distantly related to brachiopods and likely arose from a worm-like ancestor rather than a bryozoan-like organism. One last interesting feature is the foot, right down here, which projects out the back of the organism. And this foot provides a method to crawl around on the surface of the ocean floor. Now, this hypothetical ancestor is actually represented in the fossil record with a group of early primitive mollusks called the monoplacophora. Now, one of the best well-known primitive members is the genus Pelinia from the Silurian of Northern Europe. Now, Pelinia has a single top shell, has muscle scars indicating that it lived on the ocean floor and crawled around in the mud, and was protected by this hard shell from predators that would possibly eat it. Now, for many years, the monoplactophora was thought to be an extinct group of mollusks, having perished sometime during the late Silurian with a fossil record from the Cambrian to Silurian. But in 1952, scientists discovered a living member called Neopelinia from dredging the deep ocean floor. This was a really, really important discovery because it allows us to study a very primitive group of mollusks. One discovery was that Neopelia has a circle of gill structures around the outer part of the mantle 
with a central foot. It crawls around the ocean floor eating food that it finds with its mouth, much like a snail does. One interesting realization was that Neopelia was segmented, meaning that it had a series of gills and muscles. And this suggests that Neopelia and all other mollusks are closely related to annelid worms. Now, annelid worms are a group that includes earthworms and other worms with segmented bodies. Now, molecular analysis of mollusks and living annelid worms support a close relationship between these two groups. Now, sadly, we're not going to be talking much about the fossil record of annelid worms, because beside trace fossils, there's, there's not much of a fossil record of these guys. Now, from this primitive body plan, we can envision ways in which the various groups of mollusks arose. The shells could become segmented, like in chitons. It could become paired, like in bivalvia, or elongated into tubes, like the scaphopodids. Um, it could become coiled, such as in gastropods and cephalopods, such as nanoloids. Or it could even become internal, like in squids. Now note that the shell can also be lost in many groups, like, like slugs that we'll talk about. All right, so now let's look at each of these classes within the phylum mollusca. Now there are seven major groups or classes. The first group is the monplacophora, which are considered the most primitive group. Most fossils are known from the Silurian and Ordovician, but with a surprisingly sparse record for the rest of the geological periods, despite the fact that we have a living Neopelia occurring today. This means that the group was never diverse or widespread throughout most of the Mesozoic or Cenozoic, or the habitats that they occupy were not ideal for fossil preservation. Now the next group is the class Polyphylacophora, which includes the chitons. They are flat, oval-shaped mollusks with eight overlapping dorsal shell plates or valves bordered by a thick girdle forming the mantle that can be covered with hairs or spines. They kind of resemble, to me at least, roly-poly bugs. The mantle cavity contains multiple pairs of small gills surrounding the foot with which the animal typically clings to hard surfaces, just like the monoplacophora. Now the plates can be reduced or even internal in a few species, such that they can have a worm-like body. The fossil record of the polyplactophora is mostly late Cenozoic, with a number of occurrences dating back to the early Cambrian. They're not particularly well represented in the Mesozoic, and a few forms are only a few forms are known during the Triassic. During the Oligocene onwards to the Pleistocene, they're much better represented in the fossil record. Many are small, but some forms got to be over about you know, 10 centimeters in length. The next group is the Scaphopoda, the tusk shells, known from the Ordovician to the modern. These are really unusual creatures that make their living burrowing down into deep marine muds. The mouth opens below as a foot digs down with a capitaculum, a tentacle-like app app appendages that bring food to the mouth. Now the anus opens at the narrow opening at the top of the horn shell. So there's two openings. These are common fossils, and here in northeastern Utah, I found them in the late Permian Park City formation. Now because of the shape of the shell with the two openings on either end, the modern tough shells were adopted as the currency in California, where the modern genus Deltelium was used to trade for goods. The shells were also used among early Americans along the Pacific coast as decoration um, and a sign of wealth and prosperity. These shells are really rare, and they made a good currency to various tribes along the western coast. Shells were also used along the Atlantic coastline for currency, but actually came from a different group, the bivalves, which these had to be manufactured by local Atlantic tribes since they didn't have two holes on either end, and so they had to drill, uh, drill a hole through to make these beads. These beads are the ones that, those other beads are the ones that form the wampa currency that were used by the Iroquois Confederacy and the Algonquin tribes. 
And this was abandoned when Dutch colonists developed an easy way of manufacturing these cells and basically flooded the, the market with cheaper beads and causing a huge amount of inflation. This, of course, resulted in the later adoption of a, of a gold standard for trading for goods. Now, we still use the term shelling out in reference to paying for something, and that harks back to the use of these shells for currency in here in America. Now the next group is the only class that we're going to look at of mollusks that are entirely extinct. These are the Rosca conchia. Now despite having two vowels, the Rostia conchians secondarily developed two vowels. Now larval forms lack a secondary valve and they somewhat resemble the primitive monoplactophorians that we talked about, the real primitive guys. They were recognized as a separate class in 1972 and are particularly diverse during the Ordovician with about 400 known species. Now each shell have enclosed an internal anatomy that included a mouth on one side and an anus on the other side with lateral gills and a molluscan foot. They have a shell that has a long pipe that served as the anus exit and in some ways resemble the tough shells, the scapopoda, which they may have given rise to. They fed on the ocean floor with most, for most forms buried in the sediment. They diversified during the Ordovician, but hung on in the fossil record during the late Paleozoic, becoming extinct at the Permian-Triassic boundary. Now, mollusks are really great survivors, but even the greatest extinction on Earth took out some of these groups. However, the big three classes of mollusca survived this extinction with a remarkable fossil record. Now, the big three classes of mollusca are the bivalvi, the gastropoda, and the cephalopoda. Each of these are very diverse. They also include shellless forms. For bivalvia, we have the, the shellless and placophora. For gastropods, we have the shellless slugs which are a polyphyletic grouping, as many gastropods actually have lost their shells. These are the snails. And they include sea slugs and pulmonate slugs. And then we have the cephalopoda, which include the shellless octopuses. For our class, we're going to talk mostly about the forms that have shells. Now, the morphology of the shells in the three major classes share the trait that they grow through the Fibonacci series or through other logarithmic scales in which as the animal grows, it retains the same proportions. Hence, each sequence of the growth must be functional and isomeric growth. So notice in this picture here that each box shows a shell with the same dimensions as the following box, such that with each new growth, the shell resembles the same form as before, but it's only been scaled up to a larger size. Using computers, researchers can play with the theoretical limits of such coiling and use various simple growth parameters to build models of different growth patterns. So moving from the coiled shells like that found in some Plera orbid gastropods, you can change the rate of growth to produce the coiled shells like that found in some nautiloid cephalopods. Or you can reduce down to the uncoiled shell that's found in many bivalves, which have shells that are uncoiled. Or twisting the growth around the axis to produce a shell that resembles a gastropod, a snail shell. Of course, playing with these parameters can produce any combination of whorls and twists in the shell that you can build a complex range of experimental morphologies and using a few parameters, explain a whole range of shell morphologies observed in the fossil record. Let's look at the bivalvia, the first class of the big three mollusk groups. The oldest member of the group is Fordinia from the early Cambrian. It closely resembles modern bivalves, indicating that the group has remained remarkably conservative throughout the Phanerozoic. As their name suggests, bivalvia have two valves or shells. Unlike brachiopods, the bivalvia have shells that are held together by a stiff ligament. 
rather than contacting each other with a complex hinge. The ligament offers a soft hinge in which the shells can spring open, kind of like a rubber band. Bivalves have a fleshy foot and extend a siphon out of the shell. Bivalves can make a living by siphoning in detritus and food into the mantle cavity and filtering through a series of pal labial palps down here into a mouth. Paired gills also hang out in the mantle cavity in this rushing incoming water. This provides lots of oxygen to the shelled organism. The exhalant siphon up here expels the waste out of a separate opening for the anus here. Now bivalves are mobile and they can use that foot, foot and can quickly dig into sediment to escape predators or dig through the mud and muck. Bivalves close their shells by the constriction of a set of adductor muscles or a single adductor muscle in some groups. These muscles close the shell. When relaxed, they open the shell. Hence, bivalves lack a muscle to, to open the shells. And when cooked, they actually just open the shells to expose the mantle because the muscles relax when they're cooked. Both sides of the shell are mirrored images of each other with a hinge along the ligament line that connects the two halves of the shell. One of the most remarkable things about bivalves is that they have a long foot and siphons that actually extend pretty far outside of the shell which are only preserved in the fossil record as trace fossils. In fact, the movements of bivalves moving around in soft sediments is, is extremely common, but not always recognized by geologists in the rocks. All right, so let's look at the anatomy of three bivalves that you're probably likely most familiar with, the ones that we eat, oysters, clams, and scallops. Note that in each of these groups, it has a gut with a stomach, a mouth, and an anus. The mantle is ringed by a set of gills. In clams, there's a fleshy foot that comes out, which is often the chewy part of clams when you eat them. In all three groups, there's a set of muscles that close the shell, the adductor muscles. These, these adductor muscles are really rich in protein, and they actually compose the, the meat of the shellfish. With scallops, the adductor muscles are the potion, portion of the scallops that you actually eat. They're often baked or fried. So the next time you cook up some bivalves, think about what you're eating. All right, so if you crack open a bivalve, you'll find the fleshy foot right here. You're going to find the two sets of gills, the filtering polyps here that narrow down to a mouth with a gut tube that goes through there. Now the shell is the part that fossilizes among bivalves. And as such, it's the part of the animal that paleontologists are most familiar with. The articulating hinge surface contains cardinal sockets and teeth with broad pits. These hinge lines can be an important feature in identifying groups in the fossil record. The shell also exhibits growth rings, which can be tidal or seasonal. And the umbo is the initial growth protuberance on the shell, with one on each side of the shells. All right, so what are bivalve shells made out of? Well, they're composed out of layers of crystalline calcium carbonate with an organic matrix. Now, unlike brachiopods, bivalves make a shell with both calcite and aragonite. Now, both calcite and aragonite are calcium carbonate, but with different crystal lattice structures. A Aragonite is unique in that crystals form these like needle-like projections which diffract the light and these produce those iridescent shades of different wavelengths. And that effect is often called the mother, mother of pearl. And it's one of the reasons that pearls are actually so shiny. These aragonitic crystals are fragile and with burial heat and pressure, they are quickly replaced with calcite in fossils although sometimes original aragonite can survive the destructive effects of fossilization. Here are some wonderful SEM microscope images of the aragonitic crystal surface of the outer periosteum of the clam Pitar travii. These are aragonitic crystals that can trap sticky mucosal linings and form various colors and levels of shininess on, on the shell. 
The lower layers form a brick-like matrix of calcite crystal structures that make the shell really hard. And this is going to um, resist any boring from predators they're trying to drill in to eat these things. In fact, it's these layers of brick-like calcite crystals in bivalve shells which are actually preserved in the rock record. The hinges of the shells are the most important component of the fossil shell. And often paleontologists seek out specimens that preserve these hinges since their anatomy is unique to species and genera. Hence, when only fragments of the shell are preserved, it's often the hinge that's the most important for identification. Most bivalves are infaunal. That means that they live buried in sediment. The only connection to the surface waters is a long siphon that includes a path for incoming water for filtering for food and oxygen, and an exhaust siphon to get rid of waste. The siphon can be very long in some forms. Other bivalves can be borrowing bivalves, and they can use their foot pedicle to burrow down or burrow into hard substrates like wood and even hard rocks. And this boring can add additional protection from predation for these forms. One of the most unusual groups of bivalves are the rudistids, a group common to the Cretaceous, which form reefs. These colonial bivalves form long tubes capped by an upper shell and a long tubular-like lower shell. They're particularly common in the Cretaceous in Europe and North Africa. Not all bivalves are sessile. Scallops are mobile and free swimming. They use the two shells to propel themselves through the water column and can move about on the ocean floor. They have a long row of eyes, or these light sensing organs, that can help them see where they're going. Other mollusks also develop eyes and light sensing organs, which are needed when, when animals become mobile and they need to see where, where they're going. Bivalves occupy a huge range of habitats, including freshwater systems. All bivalves are aquatic. And let's actually see with the next class of mollusks um, that there are some mollusks that actually made the transition to living on land. These are the gastropods, the snails. Now, the gastropods, the gastropoda, is the first group of mollusks that have a head. Now, this is a really important innovation, since it also leads to the placement of sense organs, such as eyes in the front of the animal. These sense organs then transport information to the rest of the body along nerve cells that can trigger movements in the foot and mucus glands that are used to move the gastropod or the snail forward across the surface. The head and foot can be retracted into the coiled shell with the foot close, closing off the wall. Now, gastropods also have to have these muscles then to pull these things, these organs into the shell. The gut, the digestive organs, and the gonads are located deep in the shell and allow for this retraction of the head and foot. Now, many gastropods are hermaphroditic, although some can be male and some female, with sexual reproduction that can be done by these weird, bizarre darts that the males can shoot into the females. Snails lay eggs, which hatch into larvae known as trochophores that look a little like worms. Now, this worm-like larvae quickly develops into the sail-like vellum, um, and it has these ciliated cells that actually help this little, little fellow navigate and propel through the water. Now, during this stage, the gastropod twists and begins to grow a twisting shell, while the vellum actually forms the foot of the developing early little snail. Once it reaches this stage, it can use the muscles and maculosa glands for actually movement on the surface. Such the larvae are actually free swimming little larvae guys. Now, gastropods are predators, and where they can bore into other organisms. They can be herbivores, where they graze on algae, and scavengers, feeding on dead things that accumulate on the floor of the ocean or pond. Now, the twist in the shell gives gastropods a unique morphology that can vary in hundreds of different ways. One of the simplest morphological features is actually the actual direction of the twist, in that it can be dextral to the right or systral to the left, producing mirrored images of shells in different forms. 
The pointy end of the shell up here is called the apex. The coil angle is the suture angle, and many forms have ribs that run the length of the shell. The opening is called the aperture, and it has a flexed inner lip along one side. Often there's a groove for the siphon called the siphonal canal. Now gastropods are very diverse, and they, and they really need a class all of their own because they're really fascinating, and we just don't have enough time to cover all of gastropods. Many different forms of gastropods exist, and because their shells really readily fossilize, we can actually identify them down to species. They are amazing also for reconstructing the ancient environment in the past because many of them are found living today that we find in the fossil record. I'm going to highlight only one group of gastropods, the subclass pulmonot. These are the group of gastropods that you're probably likely most familiar with since they made the leap to living on land. They're known from the Mesozoic to recent. And instead of gills, they have actually developed lungs. And these lungs allow them to breathe on land, although they're still connected to the water for reproduction. Most are hermaphroditic, which means that each individual has the ability to start large colonies of gastropods. So just one little larvae gastropod can make it into a pond or a new environment. Then it can breed with itself to produce hundreds of new babies and establish a new population. In the fossil record, this means that you can find large numbers of individuals deposited during these big population bursts. All right, now let's look at the last group of mollusks, the highly successful cephalopoda. This group is only found in marine waters, and it includes the modern nautilus, the agronauts, squids, octopuses, and the extinct ammonites and blemonites. Now, cephalopods have the most well-developed heads, including the development of a brain, a nervous system, and complex sensory organs, such as eyes. These are the most intelligent of the invertebrate groups, and likely develop these complex brains from the shared feature of having extreme mobility, which means that they must process information quickly from the environment to survive. Now, cephalopods are swimming carnivores, and they feed on larger prey. Cephalopods are divided into three groups. The Nautiloidae, with a fossil record from the late Cambrian to the recent. The Aminatae, these are the Ammonites, from the late Devonian to late Cretaceous, and going extinct at the end of the Mesozoic with the dinosaurs. And the internal shell, or shellless, Colinidae, known from the Carboniferous to recent, which includes octopuses and squids. The Nautilus is the only living genus with a coiled external shell, which is much better represented in the fossil record and much more diverse than the single genus that we have living today. The living Nautilus does give us some insight into how these coiled cephalopods of the past may have lived. The Nautilus lives in a shell that is divided into chambers or camria. These are separated by septa that actually concave in, much like the aperture. As the animal grows, it generates a new chamber, coiling the chambers over time to make that coil. Now, the biggest chamber is the body chamber, where most of the fleshy part of the animal is found. The chambers are connected by a canal called a sphincuncle, which allows the animal to adjust its buoyancy of the shell by actually extracting fluid and leaving that to be air-filled. The Nautilus also has two eyes on either side and long tentacles that are used for capturing food and is also used in sexual mating. As a very mobile nectetic organism, the Nautilus uses a water jet to push itself through the water and escape predators. It can also cloud the water with ink with using an ink sac. The shell of the Nautilus is made of aragonite in two separate layers. Sometimes the original aragonite layer is preserved in the fossil record, giving these coiled fossils a pearly appearance. The shell of the Nautilus gives it an advantage to live in deeper depths of the ocean, living at depths below 75 meters in the dark waters below the photic zone. Now, Nautilus can rise during the night and they hunt the waters, these dark waters, for prey. They can then dive down to um, depths where larger fish and sharks can't follow. The shell actually allows them some protection from the increasing pressures of these deeper depths of the ocean.
The oldest cephalopods are found in the late Cambrian, such as the rather straight shells of the Placanorceras. But quickly afterward, coiled cephalopods become very common and diverse. The nautiloidae were very common during the Ordovician to the Carboniferous. Today, Nautilus is a small remnant of this once very diverse group. The ammonites are probably the most famous of the marine fossil invertebrate groups. They at first appeared during the Devonian and survived until the end of the Mesozoic, going extinct with the dinosaurs. They're common fossils and popular with both amateur paleontologists and biostratigraphers. Ammonites are heteromorphs, in which the shell can be seen coiled on the sides of the shell, where in nautiloids the coils cover the smaller inner coils. This difference in the coiling is thought to be from a separate origin of coiling from two different early uncoiled cephalopods, and hence the coiling found in the two groups is convergent. Now anyone interested in ammonites must learn the complexities of recognizing the suture morphology, which is key to the identification of different species of ammonites. Ammonites have complex suture lines in their shells. These mark the junctions between septum. They can be seen even in fragmentary fossils. Suture morphology is often illustrated with unique terms for their various waggles of the suture line. Some are extremely complex, while others are rather simple. Ammonites are amazingly diverse with hundreds of groups represented in the rock record. Because there are so many species and they're easily recognized from sutures and they have short durations in the fossil record, they're excellent index fossils, particularly during the Devonian to Cretaceous. Here in North America, the ammonites are an important index fossil for the Western Interior Seaways during the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. The last group that we're going to examine is the subclass Colneidae. That include the Blemonites, the squids, the cuttlefish, the octopuses, and the aragonauts. These are recognized in the fossil record by several members of this group having inter an interior skeleton and calcite forming the part, the hard part that's actually preserved in the fossil record. In cuttlefish, this is a calcareous bone that helps with buoyancy. This can be preserved in the fossil record since it's composed of calcium carbonate. This chemistry is also why it's given to birds and sold in pet stores as a source of calcium. The Blemonites are another group that have a hard part that's preserved in their fossil record, but the group is entirely extinct, um, but probably likely was related to modern squid. The shell of Blemonites is composed of three parts. The largest part is called the guard, a bullet-shaped cylinder of solid calcite. Now further back is the aragnitic phragma cone, a cone-shaped structure. And then further back, but very rarely preserved, is a proosceum. This is a flat, expanded tongue that actually cover, would have covered some of the body of the squid-like creature. The guard is the part that most often preserves. And inside it is a narrow tube or opening a channel that runs through the center. And much like the coiled uh, cephalopods, probably served as a air-filled chamber to help with buoyancy. Now, blemonites are very common in some deposits. Here in Utah, blemonites are common in the Jurassic stump or Curtis formations. They're used in many studies as a source of oxygen and carbon isotopes to look at changes in temperature of the ancient oceans. All right, before I sign off with this lecture, I wanted to mention something about what an argonaut is. These are also called the paper nautiluses. And while they look like a nautilus or even an ammonite, they are actually the reproductive chambers of female octopuses. Now, the female octopus of the species um, secretes this thin shell. And it actually secretes the shell, and it fills it with air. And these are used to help incubate the eggs and brood baby octopuses, and sometimes even trapping tiny males inside these chambers. These shells are not attached to the animal, and the octopus can float free of these chambers. They're sometimes preserved in the fossil record and are known in the late Cenozoic. All right, thanks for watching another paleontology lecture. 
If you're interested in taking a class with Utah State University in geology, take a look at our department website at geology.usu.edu. And if you're interested in my research and who I am, you should take a look at my website at benjamin Thanks for watching.